Okay, hello everyone. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Matthew Herbert, who is here to talk about navigating chronic pain as a roadmap, biopsychosocial perspectives, and treatment progression. Most of you already know Matt, um, I think. Um, Matt just uh, finished his postdoctoral fellowship at the VA Center of Excellence for Stress and Mental Health, and he's now working as a research scientist at the Veterans Medical Research Foundation. Matt started his um, academic career at, at, the, at Cal State University San Bernardino. That's where he received his bachelor's and master's degree in psychology and experimental psychology. He then went on to University of Alabama in Birmingham to get his doctorate in clinical psychology, came back to the West Coast and uh, did his pre-doctoral internship at RVA and then joined CSAM as a postdoctoral fellow where I had um, the pleasure of working with him and mentoring him and being very proud of all of his accomplishments. Um, he recently received news that his career development award at the VA will be funded, so he's really looking forward, and I'm very much looking forward to him having his, um, establishing his academic home here at uh, UCSD in our department. So without further ado, Dr. Herbert. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rafari. So uh, I'm going to jump right into this. I have a lot of slides to, to cover. Uh, I will be aware of time as much as I can. So yeah, so this is the a title that I came up with. And uh, the reason for it, uh, which will hint towards my CDA as well, but I think the roadmap serves as a useful metaphor when we think of something as complex as chronic pain. Um, both from a patient's perspective, we want to help them almost get a roadmap of, of how they're going to navigate uh, their, their, their condition they have. But I think also uh, from the perspective of researchers and clinicians, it's also important that we develop a kind of roadmap together of how to best, best treat patients. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I've done in both uh, the biopsychosocial uh, understanding of chronic pain as well as the treatment of chronic pain. So a little bit of my overview I'll do, uh, talk to you a little bit about pain and chronic pain, the work that I've done uh, in race and ethnicity in pain the treatment of pain from a psychosocial perspective, my career development award, and uh, some of my future plans. Uh, well, just I'll rush through this a little bit to save time. I knew we were already uh, outlined this uh, for me. I was born here in Southern California. I went to Cal State San Bernardino in 2007, got my bachelor's. Was then I uh, got my MA at uh, the same place. I then made a uh, pretty drastic move to the south where I lived at the University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham. I was there for four years, uh, started saying the word y'all more often than I do now, which I still do, uh, and then quickly returned to San Diego uh, to do my internship, uh, complete my postdoctoral fellowship in the Center of Excellence for Stress and Mental Health, and here I am now giving this presentation, and in the future, I will be starting my career development award, which I will uh, discuss. So uh, conceptualizing my, my program of research, uh, I see that there's two parallel paths that I have going here that I plan on maintaining into the future. Um, one of these paths are the mechanisms of chronic pain, how we understand how the development and maintenance of chronic pain, and then the other path being, well, how do we treat chronic pain? And of course, the idea is that these two paths are going to influence each other. So my introduction to pain research came from Cal State University. I did basic science at that time, looking at rodent models. And uh, as part of a, a large body of research, I was looking at the long-term consequences of exposing rats to uh, methylphenolate at, a, at an early age, that's, that's Ritalin, and seeing how that affected their opioid system uh, as adults, uh, in addition to a nociception, we're also looking at drug reward. And in Birmingham, uh, the body of research I was involved in was looking at biopsychosocial factors underlying uh, race differences in individuals that need osteoarthritis. As I came to my postdoc here, shifted to looking more at outcomes of, of chronic pain, uh, psychosocial treatment, but still maintains my interest and, and work in the biopsychosocial factors related to pain, but now looking more at the pain experience in OEF and OEF veterans. And this informs some of the work that I did, the outcomes, where some of these factors that we do know about 
uh, with the data I had, I was able to look at, well, is this actually moderating treatment outcomes? Again, trying to go back and forth between these two paths. And uh, in the future going on here, this is what my dotted lines represents, I'll continue these two paths, one avenue being my CDA that I'll be doing, as well as some of the newer work I've started with a, a spine surgeon here, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So, pain to me is this interesting experience because it's something that we all have experienced. It's part of our survival, really. Um, and early on in my life, I learned quite a bit about pain. Uh, I've told this story many times at talks, and I'll tell it to you all again. Um, my father uh, is a self-employed diesel mechanic. And I remember growing up and watching him go to work uh, seemingly fairly injured. And when asked about this, his response was, well, if I don't go to work, then we can't have dinner. And just outlining the idea that like, his employment was based on him going to work and whether he was hurt or not, he was going to work. And at the same time, I had an aunt that suffered from fibromyalgia. And I could see how this debilitated her, and yet she did not have any visible signs of, of injury. So before I knew anything about the pain literature, I knew that things like motivation and stress played into the pain experience. And so it goes without saying that pain is rather complex. And even when you look at the definition of pain that comes from the International Association for the Study of Pain, we see that it's fairly blurry, right? They refer to it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience and outline that tissue damage need to be actual or potential or described in such terms. The, the damage doesn't even have to be there for there to be called pain. And then when you think about acute versus chronic pain, uh, the picture becomes even more fuzzy. Uh, with chronic pain, oftentimes the etiology isn't very clear. Uh, the medications that we've used for acute pain say after surgery, in the long term, they aren't effective for chronic pain. And then we also get into adverse uh, side effects. So I'm not going to blow this too much. I think we all know that chronic pain is a big problem for the United States. Um, cost uh, estimates of up to 100 million, uh, sorry, estimates up to a half trillion dollars a year, affecting almost a third of the population throughout the lifespan, and can seemingly impact every aspect of an individual's life. Not fun. And so, if we take a step back and ask, like, okay, from a healthcare perspective, what, what is our goal with chronic pain management? Like, what are we trying to do? And we see that the goals have actually, they've shifted. Uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we saw that the goal was, there was this emphasis on reducing pain intensity. And this is when opioid medications started to be using much more liberally for non-cancer related pain. And this maintained itself to about 2005 or something like that, where all of a sudden with things like opioid addiction becoming more and more prevalent and, and, and aware on people's radar, there was a shift that was happening and now, uh, the National Pain Strategy, which is made up of a group of leading experts in pain, the goal has now been restated to alleviate pain, and there's much more of an emphasis on restoring function. And they outline two methods for reducing the burden of pain. One being, again, let's understand more about the development and maintenance of pain, focusing on the biopsychosocial mechanisms, and then let's develop safe and effective pain treatments. And so, again, they, they themselves, too, have outlined this two-path approach, basically, of how we're going to improve chronic pain. This is what the biopsychosocial model looks like, or at least one, one depiction of it. Again, as you can see, it's, it's complex. There's a lot of things that go into uh, the chronic pain experience. The biomedical model is, is pretty much unanimously agreed upon now that that's insufficient to explain pain. There are certainly psychological factors and social factors that are important. Now, one variable that I spent uh, a good deal uh, studying and, and continue studying is race and ethnicity. Now, one reason, I guess, well, a good reason to study race and ethnicity is that many studies show racial ethnic differences in the pain experience. Uh, you see this in clinical pain across various uh, chronic pain etiologies, uh, as well as in experimental pain in both healthy young people without pain, as well as those that have chronic pain. And it's interesting to me uh, for a number of reasons, uh, one of them being that 
it seems to cut across the biopsychosocial components. There's biological aspects that play into the racial differences that we see, as well as psychological and uh, social. And I'm going to outline a little bit of work that I've done, done in this area. So in uh, Alabama, where I was, I was part of a multi-site uh, multi um, project looking at racial differences in knee osteoarthritis. The project was called Upload, Understanding Pain and Limitations in Osteoarthritic Vertic Disease. And one of the uh, main methods that we use to, to look at differences and analyze them is what's referred to as quantitative sensory testing. This is a, a fancy word that basically means experimental pain testing. And its definition is the, de the determination of thresholds and stimulus response curves for nociceptive sensory processing. This was a fairly large group at UAB. Um, and we did a lot of work. Uh, we got a lot of papers out of this. So, we established that within our middle to older aged adults with knee osteoarthritis, there was racial differences in both uh, experimental and clinical pain. We outlined some biological factors that, that explain some of this relationship, one of them being uh, vitamin D levels. Uh, one of the first papers that I did there was looking at pain hypervigilance. Uh, race and ethnicity wasn't the focus of that paper, but we did see racial differences in pain hypervigilance, so how much how sensitive you are to the threat of pain, how much you look out for pain signals, as well as more social variables like perceived racial discrimination and how people's report of racial discrimination itself uh, mediated the differences that we were seeing in, in heat pain tolerance between the non-Hispanic white and African-American individuals with, with knee osteoarthritis. Now, uh, from this uh, body of work uh, came uh, my dissertation. And for my, dis for my dissertation, I was interested in the pain cortisol relationship. Now, this relationship itself is fairly, fairly complex, uh, but there's been a lot, a lot of work done on this, as well as looking at racial differences in this. And some of my dissertation, the idea was sparked for a group uh, that was out in Chapel Hill. Uh, and they were showing that when they looked at the difference between uh, race and ethnicity and pain, they found that cortisol seemed to be functioning different, differently in the, in the two racial groups that they were studying. And so this is one of the, the main components of my, of my dissertation. So a little bit of our demographics here. 63% um, African American individuals that were uh, recruited from the community and other uh, were obviously uh, non-Hispanic white individuals. And uh, my, pain, my experimental pain task chosen was the cold presser task. So the cold presser task is uh, it's pretty straightforward. You put your hand or your foot into a cold water bath, and you report on your pain experience that, that, that you're experiencing. And if you've ever done it before, it's not very really fun. Um, but one reason why I chose it uh, was not to be mean. It's rather that uh, cortisol has been most consistently linked to this task. It, it uh, interplays with, with the HPA access system. And so you'd measure things like how, how painful uh, the stimulus is, and you can also see how long people can keep their hands in the water too. So there's a couple different measures that you can get, get from this. And what I found is I essentially replicated what the group was showing in, in healthy, pain-free individuals out in Chapel Hill, was that when you looked at the levels of cortisol right before the task, this was predictive of the pain experience for non-Hispanic white individuals uh, that were in the experiment, but not for the African American individuals. Um, again, suggesting that even cortisol is a variable that seems to be potentially one of the, the biological factors underlying the race differences that, that, we, that we see, uh, in this case, in knee osteoarthritis. And uh, yeah, and we published this uh, a couple of years, uh, I guess a year ago now, in the Clinical Journal of Pain. Coming into my postdoctoral fellowship, um, again, the, the sample changed. Right? I wasn't using community individuals. I was now looking at veterans that, that were part of uh, data sets that I had access to. And uh, working with a post-bachelor that was here once upon a time, uh, there was this interest in looking at social support and resilience, so not pain, but resilience, and again, and how race and ethnicity interplayed with this. So uh, resilience, which you know, refers to the ability uh, 
how you recover from stressful events, right? How, how resilient you are. Uh, it's an important variable across a number of uh, fields because it's, it's protective against various mental and physical health conditions, including chronic pain. And the literature out there, uh, you'll find support for a positive association between resilience and uh, social support, which kind of, we just uh, make assumptions about that. It, it makes sense. The more social support we have, the more resilient we, we, we can be. However, we also know from the literature that there, there are racial and ethnic differences in the function of social support. And a lot of studies out there, like a lot of studies in, uh, in general, they either did not take race or ethnicity into consideration, or the samples were largely non-Hispanic white. So a question that came from this is, well, if there are differences in the function of social support, is the relationship between resilience and social, social support, does that differ by race and ethnicity? And so we had access to a large database here. This came from the e-screening uh, data set, uh, which Dr. Nidhu Afari was the PI on. Um, so I had a nice representation of uh, these four groups, which are the four largest groups that are in the US military, fairly young individuals, primarily male. And what we found is that it does matter because the expected relationship that we were, that we would, that we'd find in literature was indeed found in the non-Hispanic white veterans where the more social support that they were receiving, uh, the more resilience that they were also reporting. But there is virtually no relationship at all in the Hispanic and Asian American uh, veterans. And African American veterans were somewhere in between, but it was not statistically significant. So interesting, and uh, we, we took this data and we recently uh, published this in, in psychiatry uh, research. And so this certainly got the ball rolling on this other avenue, or maybe uh, sub-avenue, if you will, um, for continuous work. Uh, a logical place that I took from this was, well, if we know the relationship between resilience and social support differs, let's now look at pain and see if we see something similar. So I want to show you guys, these are some preliminary data that I'm working with, so, so new, uh, hot off the press. And some of the background and rationale for this is, is just like uh, resilience, social support itself has been shown to be a protective factor for chronic pain. However, as, to the best of our knowledge, there's been no research on ethnic differences in the pain social support relationship. So basically just substituting resilience for chronic pain, or, or pain actually, I shouldn't say chronic pain, and see if we see something similar. And so we have here as measure of pain severity, this was from the, the Promise uh, Pain Questionnaire. And on the x-axis, we have the number of emotional support sources. So people identified how many people they basically have in their corner for, for emotional support. So either 0, 1, 2, 3, or, or 4 plus. We truncated because of uh, small uh, sample size in the cells. And what we found is that in the non-Latino white group, we saw the relationship that we would basically expect to see, where people's reported pain decreased as their number of social support sources increased. When we look at the Latino uh, group, uh, my prediction going into this was just like the resilience, we would see basically like a flat line, like it, it wouldn't really matter. And to our uh, uh, surprise, we saw that we basically had a reflection of what was going on in the non-Hispanic uh, white group. Where now what we were seeing is that as our number of emotional support sources increased, we saw their pain severity scores were increasing. And this is a robust finding. Um, you can throw in uh, covariates, it stays. Uh, there's also a report of pain interference that uh, people answered. Uh, if you look at that, it basically looks like the same thing. So it's very preliminary, uh, and we're still wrapping our heads around what this means. I think at least one of the stabs that, that we can make at this is that um, Perhaps in the non-Latino white group, the more pain they're experiencing, the more they tend to isolate, almost. Uh, you don't go out as much. You, you don't seek others because you're in pain. There's, there might be more isolation going on. Whereas in the Latino group, um, although we did not have any uh, measures of, of cultural constructs, uh, if we make an assumption that the Latino group may be more family-oriented than, than, than the, the non-Latino white group, it might be something that the more pain one is in, the more they're reaching out and accessing emotional support. 
So just a speculation, something that needs to go in. We need to obviously think about this more, uh, but uh, data that I'm very interested in and we'll be looking forward to, to work more with uh, as we move forward. So I'll, now we transition. So this is, again, some of the work that I've done on the biopsychosocial mechanisms, concentrating primarily on, on race and ethnicity. And now uh, I want to turn to talk a little bit more about chronic pain treatment. How do we treat individuals with, with chronic pain? So it's always interesting to me when we do group statistics uh, on our data and report on groups, but when it comes to chronic pain treatment, right, we're always treating individuals. They're not groups of people or means. They're individuals like this. This looks a lot like people that I've treated uh, in, in behavioral medicine clinics. Um, you know, probably mid-50s maybe, you can see he's a little bit overweight probably and obviously has some shoulder pain going on. So obviously the biological component of the biopsychosocial model is very important. You know, I think we do need to develop better pharmaceuticals to treat it. We need invasive and non-invasive uh, procedures to, to help these individuals. But as a psychologist, when I look at somebody, I acknowledge that we basically have a snapshot of, of what we're looking at. And just like everybody here in this room, this person here has a fairly complex history. Um, that's, you know, he was born and basically came in the world with his own genetic predisposition for pain or to, to, to not have pain. Um, we, could have, we could just pretend that as he went through life, maybe he was a, uh, a football star in high school and he still looks back on that and says, man, those are my glory days and today is not like that, right? Maybe he's had a couple of divorces, maybe he suffers from road rage. All of these things that actually play into the pain experience that's something like a medication or something like that isn't going to fully address. And because these aspects do interplay with the pain experience, I think it's one of the great rationales for looking at the psychosocial aspect of pain. So uh, the psychosocial treatment of pain. So here are two broad goals for this type of intervention. One is to minimize the negative consequences associated with pain. And then two is to help individuals sustain positive engagement in their lives despite having pain. So roughly trying to hit these, these, these two broad areas and essentially try to get people moving as much as is possible as long as they're not doing more damage by moving. But by and large, there's a problem of people not moving enough, not moving too much. Uh, one psychosocial treat, treatment approach that I find particularly fascinating uh, is accepting some commitment therapy. And I'll tell you just a, a little bit about this because it will play into to my CDA. So uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, uh, is based on the psychological flexibility model. So this, this clearly delineates the goal of ACT treatment, and that's to increase the ability to behave consistently with one's values, uh, even in the face of unwanted thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. In other words, it really tries to help people do this, sort of, go towards things that are important, meaningful to them, that's the values, while uh, accepting or, or tolerating, uh, I should say accepting, not tolerating, um, the negative things that might come along with that experience. In treatment, we target six core processes, and, and that's all. There's six larger constructs that are, that are targeted no more. And in this way, I think, I think ACT is a relatively straightforward treatment. And to to facilitate these, these treatment processes, we're going to use metaphors and experiential exercises, or rather emphasize them, as opposed to just a, a standard sort of psychoeducational approach that, that is more common in other approaches. So for example, if we take cognitive diffusion. So cognitive diffusion uh, refers to the ability to see uh, basically a distinction between thoughts and the things that they describe, and to be able to contact experiences without being dominated by, by those thoughts. So, so for example, if I have the thought, I'm unlovable, a, a, a fused aspect of this would be like, I can't, you know, get, uh, this is who I am, I'm unlovable, right? A diffused part of this is when we can see that thought as a thought and be able to move forward without being dominated by this thought. But what I just described to you is rather complex. Um, I would not do this in, in, a, in a therapy session what I, would, what I would do instead is, is something like this. I would say, uh, you know, Mr. Frank, 
I would like to do uh, an exercise with you. Are you willing to do this? And after I got consent, we would both do something like this. We would say out loud this while we do this. I can't possibly raise my hand. I can't possibly raise my hand. I can't possibly raise my hand. And then we would allow that to facilitate the discussion to come. So I would say, well, how was that for you? And maybe this person would say, that's kind of weird to be doing the opposite thing that you say you're going to do. And then from there, that might lead into a conversation about, well, what does this have to do with your pain, right? And if we find out that when it comes to pain, a thought might be, well, this thought, this, this pain is excruciating. Of course I can't go to Disneyland with my family. Then all of a sudden it's like, can you basically do, you don't do what you say. You know, these thoughts that you're having, if we experience a distinction between them, we might get more flexibility to, to make movement towards, again, things that are important. And there's good efficacy for ACT. It's a newer cognitive behavioral treatment, uh, but there have been several RCTs done out there. Uh, treatment effects generally in the medium range, so I think we still can improve upon ACT, um, and it is part of the nationwide VA rollout. Some work that I've done on ACT as a postdoc um, was there's a, a non-inferiority randomized controlled trial that, that happened here. Uh, asking the question is, can telehealth delivery of ACT be delivered with a similar efficacy as in-person. Again, we're doing these exercises with, with our uh, patients, right? So uh, it's a very logical question, like does this translate over when all of a sudden you take out this human element? So we had 128 uh, adults, a relatively uh, broad inclusion criteria, just had to have chronic pain and how that pain interfere with your life. And it, this was, these were eight week, 60 minute, 60 minute sessions, again, either in-person or through uh, video teleconferencing. And what we found is that uh, when we looked at uh, pain interference, which is that's from the brief uh, pain inventory, uh, that was the primary outcome, they both operated about, about the same. Uh, they were non-inferior, which means that they were similar. They were statistically similar. And on a scale, a one-point decrease is considered is the minimal clinically significant change that they both had clinical significant change that was maintained at, at six month follow up. So this answered the question, yes, ACT can be delivered via video teleconferencing with, with similar effects. Also with this data set, it, it allowed me to ask this, this interesting question of looking at the role of neuropsychological functioning and ACT. So I'm gonna make some, some quick changes here. Um, but again, if we go back to the, the two-path approach, right, some of the work that we have been doing, we, we know that uh, when we look at things like neuropsychological functioning, it does play into people's report of pain and how much it affects them. So when we compare to pain-free controls, uh, we see that chronic pain, there, there's neuropsychological deficits. And then when we look within a chronic pain sample, we see that the more uh, pain people are reporting, the, the worse the neuropsychological functioning is. When we also consider the fact that basically every cognitive behavioral treatment, even if it is ACT, deals with some aspect of neuropsychological functioning. You know, when we're dealing with patients, we still are expecting that they are, understand the words that are coming out of their mouth, that they have planning abilities, that there's that memory are intact. So it is certainly a worthwhile question to ask if the relationship between uh, treatment outcomes, if that differed based on neuropsychological functioning. And we were able to answer that question with, with this data set. So together uh, with the Bondi group, uh, we developed a small battery of uh, a neuropsychological test to, to, to tap four broad domains. So we used the DCAF's color word interference, basically the street task as a crude measure of executive functioning. Uh, the letter number sequencing task from the WACE uh, as a measure of working memory, uh, the symbol search as a measure of processing speed, and then the California verbal learning test as a measure of, of semantic memory. And so these are just the, the measures that we had at baseline. And so curiously, uh, I was also able to, to report on this, which I hadn't seen much about in the data set, I mean in, in the literature out there, that when we look at how it correlated with the, the constructs, it wasn't hanging so much with our measure of uh, working memory and, and semantic memory, but rather with executive functioning and processing speed as a crude construct. Um, so, and then what I did is using linear mixed models, 
I looked at to see if these no psychological function at baseline, if it moderated treatment outcomes during that eight week active or chronic pain treatment. And what we found is that for the most part, wasn't much going on until we get to the more variables that were capturing more of the emotional functioning of our patients. That's where we saw the significant interactions with, with change. And curiously, when we plotted these out to understand more about them, this is showing you just on executive functioning and, and change in depression severity, we found that those with relatively lower executive functioning at baseline essentially got more out of the treatment than those with higher executive functioning. And it might be opposite of what you would, would think, uh, especially if, you, if we have the assumption that, well, you need to be, have been neuropsychologically intact to fully grasp like this treatment. You might expect the opposite way, but what the data shows is that those that had relatively low executive functioning had a steeper uh, slope compared to those with, with higher executive functioning. So I also, but I do want to point out too, they started out higher too. So you also have this, they, they had more to lose as, as well. Um, but nonetheless, you didn't see this with the pain, the more pain variables like pain interference and pain severity is with the emotional functioning variables. And it, and it certainly answered the question that based on a, a relatively a decent distribution of neuropsychological functioning, it didn't seem to really impact treatment outcomes. So now I'll transition a little bit to talk about my career development award, which was definitely based on the work that I had been doing with, with ACT. And so what, if I look back in my own history, what sparked my idea of the career, career development award was my own personal interest in formal mindfulness meditation. Meditation was something that I was exposed to uh, the first year in graduate school in Birmingham, Alabama. So it was not in California. It was in the deep south. <laughs> and it really came about, it, it, to me it was so cool because in, in UAB, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was really like, dominated. And I came here for my pre-doctoral internship. All of a sudden it was, a, it was really cool that I got to be exposed to these, these third wave cognitive behavioral therapies that incorporated aspects of, of, of meditation. And as I learned more about the meditation approaches and I thought about ACT, which I liked so much, a very curious thing uh, was there, and that's that the creators of ACT, they, they did not emphasize formal meditation at all. If, any, if anything, they de-emphasized it and emphasized more what they call informal meditation or informal mindfulness. You know, they want to help people get into their life and be aware of what's going on now not necessarily sit for 20 minutes and be, you know, almost like an escape from, from life or something like that. So the, the question has never been stated specifically, can form, formal mindfulness meditation bolster psychological flexibility? Again, psychological flexibility being the, the goal of that, to move forward towards values regardless of what inner experiences are going on. And there's some a uh, good rationale for, for looking at this. Uh, like I just said, uh, current ACT approaches, they really emphasize the informal mindfulness aspect of it. They don't emphasize the actual sitting meditation of it. But there's, th there's both theoretical and empirical support that sitting meditation might, that targets these ACT processes. So these are some outcomes from uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction primarily, which is an approach that focuses uh, primarily on sitting meditation. And finally, what was and what really like sealed the deal for me is that you know like that act treatment that was uh, once a week, 60 minutes, and then presumably people do homework, but we know they don't necessarily the rest of doing homework, and then they come back and they do another 60 minute treatment. And so I thought, man, it'd be so awesome if I, if we could get people to actually like practice, and then when they came into treatment, we were able to really tie that together with what we were doing in treatment, and so. But just like any other practice that we might do, we, we do see dose response relationships. The more one meditates, the more change that we see. The more one meditates, the more that we can see the brain literally like changing to it. I mean, I think at this point, I don't know if we can say meditation isn't a thing. It's totally a thing. And with my interest in this uh, came the development of a, a clinical group that I ran here. And this again, this is before the CDA even came, came about. I was asked by Dr. Pia Hefner, who was my um, supervisor at that time, to create a transdiagnostic mindfulness group. 
So this is so where people in primary care could send someone, whether they're having problems with, with anger or pain or depression, whatever it might be. So I said, sure. So I developed this group. I based the group on the psychological flexibility model. So similar to ACT, we, we targeted those, those six processes, but not similar to ACT, but more similar to more of the, the more meditation-based approaches. It's centered on formal meditation. That's what we did in every single group for homework. It, the only homework basically was to, to do meditation 20 minutes a day, up to 20 minutes a day, and to use logs to record how much you did. And I just a small body of questionnaires that are based on the post-treatment, uh, six groups across a couple of years, and 31 uh, treatment completers, about a 20% dropout rate, which we typically see in, in our interventions. And I look at some of the results. Again, these are you know, small sample sizes. They always, always get that into consideration. I saw a you know, nice change on the, on the measures that I gave. So a measure of quality of life. This was the, the mindful action and awareness scale, the mindful awareness and attention scale, I think it is, the mass. And then this was a measure created specifically for ACT purposes, a measure of cognitive fusion. Again, I can't raise my hand. I can't raise my hand. Trying to tap into that construct. And because I am interested in dose response relationships, when I plotted change versus on the y-axis to how many minutes people were reported that they, that they meditated, what I, found, I found the strongest effect for cognitive fusion. Virtually no relationship with quality of life, uh, decent relationship with change in mindfulness. It really seemed to be hitting on this change in cognitive fusion. It's, uh, the R there is about a, a 0.4. And so I thought this was great. And this was used as preliminary data uh, for my CDA and my CDA, which was recently awarded. So uh, my CDA is called Mindful Action for Pain. So again, that's how the roadmap thing comes back in, full circle. Uh, an integrated approach to improve chronic pain function. So I want to give a shout out to my team. Dr. Afari here is my, my primary mentor. Uh, Ariel Lane and Adam Bacchus will be my co-mentors. Paula Kazma, who is here, will be my, my meditation consultant. Uh, Steve Hayes, who is the developer of ACT as a consultant to make sure we don't deviate too much from the psychological flexibility model. And then uh, Samantha Hurst and Shaw Golshan for uh, my statistics consultant. And just so, so real briefly what this my award is, it's, it's a two-phase project that I proposed. The first phase is to fully develop this approach. Uh, to start with the protocol and adapt it for chronic pain from the mindful living group that I did. Uh, same sort of eight-session protocol, 90 minutes, but four small groups. And as part of my, my training, and also uh, to be practical with this too, to do a lot of qualitative research at this part. I understand that meditation is something that a lot of people, I'm not going to name anybody in the room, but people that I talk to, it, it is a behavior that can be hard to initiate and maintain. So I'm interested in how do we actually get people to meditate as a behavior. Um, I certainly have my own thoughts about how to do that. So the first uh, year and a half, for the most part, we'll be doing this. And then the second phase of this is to do what they call like a pilot randomized controlled trial and, and look at the efficacy, or I'm sorry, to evaluate the feasibility, not efficacy, the feasibility of, of MAP, my approach, versus cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain. Now, I haven't, touched, I haven't talked much about CBT for chronic pain. At this point, it still is the gold standard produces about moderate treatment effects, just like ACT. It's no better than ACT at this point. Um, and because it is a gold standard, my thoughts going into this is that if we don't see any signal that maybe this is a worthwhile approach to, to, to pursue that might one day be superior to cognitive behavioral therapy, we might as well as go back to the drawing board. I didn't want to compare the group to a, a no treatment group. Because again, it's, it's an integrated approach. I'm using empirically supported treatments, basically just putting them together in a, in a, in a unique way. So the primary outcome is going to be pain interference. Here you see some of our secondary outcomes, pain acceptance, a trait mindfulness and pain catastrophizing. Some exploratory aims, uh, definitely interested in, in looking at those dose response relationships. Again, that's what I, I really think is driving some of this. And as well as to explore some objective measures of physical activity. So they're going to be wearing actographs, basically. And I'm interested in their self-report of improved function is mapping on to their objective measure of, of improved function. So that's the CDA. Um, in terms of my other future directions, uh, I have a host of ongoing collaborations I hope to keep on uh, doing in the future, and many of them who are here. 
uh, Dr. Nuru Fari and I also uh, collaborate looking at, at ACT and, and weight loss. So not pain, but looking at weight loss. Uh, Dr. Amy Jack and I look at the relationship between MTBI and pain outcomes. Uh, Dr. Sonny Mann and I have started working, looking at PTSD and some pain outcomes. Uh, Julie Weatherall had a lot of the data that I used before. Ara Lang has a, a new grant looking at yoga for PTSD, and we're developing uh, a experimental pain task that's going to be a component of that. And uh, most recently, I started collaborating with a, a spine surgeon here at the VA and also at the UCSD, uh, Dr. Sina Portahari, and we're interested in, in improving spine surgery outcomes. So um, right now, we have some data collection going on. And we have future plans of sort of developing a, a program uh, to hopefully try to basically catch people that are interested in spine surgery, make sure they've addressed what they, what they can address, and work with them to try to improve the, the long-term outcomes of spine surgery, which right now, frankly, are not, are not great. Uh, because of time, I'll, I'll talk too much more about this, but we will be giving a talk on November 2nd in the VA Main Hospital. Uh, you guys are all welcome to, to come, of course. And then uh, I'm also open to future collaborations. Um, I have been in talk with uh, Dr. Mark Wallace and Igor Grant about some potential cannabis and pain projects in the, in the future. Um, and if anybody, I collaborate with so many people in this room already, but if you're interested in more, though, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely open. And just to expand, uh, I really see, as much as I don't like technology and it scares me personally, I definitely see it's our way forward of really trying to improve the outcomes that, that we see. Um, I do attend the mental health tech groups here with, with uh, Dr. Eric Grandholm. Uh, haven't done anything there yet, but definitely interested in moving towards a real-time assessment of how people are doing. Um, you know, it just blows my mind that as much as we know about psychology, we, we know that if someone comes in and they got cut off and they, you know, on, on their way to their VA and they didn't sleep really good, we know the situational factors are going to influence their, their report of how much depression or pain they're feeling, um, but we can't do much about that using the measures that we do. So I really want to move towards trying to more accurately understand what's going on in these people's lives, and I think technology is a way of doing that. And also, because I'm interested in meditation adherence, I don't know of any good app that allows you to track this yet, um, but maybe somehow we can visibly see where people are meditating, when, how, you know, I, I think that'll be really interesting. I know uh, Polly, who also runs meditation groups, sometimes what people say they're doing they, what they meditate is, is not meditating at all. Um, so yeah, technology. It might kill us, but it might also save us before. Uh, and lastly, just I want to outline some teaching activities uh, that I do here. I do give uh, a couple of guest lectures every year, primarily on acceptance and commitment therapy and, and the use of the psychological flexibility model, uh, both at UCSD and USD. Um, I'd like to have plans and would like to get more involved in the joint doctoral program in clinical psychology here, uh, both in terms of research and clinical mentorship. And in terms of the VA hospital activities, I am a part of the complementary and integrative health committee. Um, and I also uh, run a drop-in mindfulness group where that's open to everyone in this room if you want to join. Uh, that's on Mondays from 8.30 to 9 a.m. in the Spiritual Center in the VA Hospital. That used to be the chapel. Um, and yeah, on Mondays, we just, we just sit and meditate uh, before we start the day. So nothing too, too crazy going on. And to, to end with, um, I really don't mean this for us to be cheesy, but Dr. Farr, who knows me very well, um, you know, for my own personal passion, I, I don't want to forget about why I got into psychology in the first place, right? So um, really the ultimate goal here is to help people that have chronic pain, um, like my aunt with fibromyalgia, right? How do we really help those individuals live a better life? And I really do think there's something special with a, a value, a, a, a treatment approach where moving towards values is, is the ultimate goal. And I think if we can do that, and we, can, we help bring some natural reinforcement into people's lives, we help bring some positive affect in there, we might see the whole chronic pain problem just gets a little bit less, less intense than it is right now. So uh, like this person's doing there, whatever's going on, there's still move, movement going on. And on that, I'll thank you and take any questions.
questions? Got to be some questions out there. There's one over there. Really excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for that. I'm curious about your depression and executive functioning results, and if you could talk a little bit more about the baseline differences and whether those were statistically significant differences at starting, and um, also about what those mean for where they're starting with their executive functioning. Is that in the normal range? Is that impaired? Um, that's what I was curious about. Sure. Yeah, so, so to look at, uh, as I looked at based on, again, across all the measures that we did have, uh, they were primarily related to our, again, I, I keep saying executive functioning, but our, our, that's a lot of things, right? Our crude measure executive functioning and, and, and symbol search. And so I for depression, for example, you see a 0.24. So they are statistically different at, at baseline, even though, you know, when we, run, when we look at the interaction, right, these are looking at continuous by continuous interaction. So when we plot them, we did a median split to see like where it is. So it's a little bit of a biased way of like, you know, sort of creating two groups when there actually wasn't two groups. So there's, when you do moderation analysis, ideally you don't have significant differences at, at baseline for things like regression of the mean effects, things like that going on which aren't actually like going on like in your treatment. So uh, so it's something we certainly like addressed like in a paper and if we had a control condition that would be really nice to sort of see well do we see something similar going on within individuals that maybe didn't, didn't get any intervention like whatsoever. I think it's still curious though because again when we look at how much these variables are related to all the other measures too it's still only depression and pain and anxiety where there's some action going on. So I don't feel that non-treatment specific things are going on. One interpretation that we had uh, in the um, discussion was that, you know, going back to the usage of metaphors and experiential exercises and, and ACT, one reason why these are used is to limit the verbal communication of, of this, right? And, you know, metaphors, which arguably are at the base of how human language developed anyway, you see that these are used with people that have severe traumatic brain injuries to, to get across larger treatment concepts. So as a speculation, it might be those with relatively low executive functioning, they fully understand the co concepts going on, and maybe people that are a little bit more verbal, maybe they struggle a little bit more with some of the concepts because they basically have more language skills to do this, which, as you know, being an active person yourself, we're not trying to get them to do. So speculation and, and so interesting, but again, I think they're valid Again, because um, we don't see this cutting across all the groups, right? Only with the depression and, and, and uh, pain related anxiety. It's really interesting learning about your research, and I just think it's so cool that your first grant is a treatment that you developed. Um, you encouraged me to do that, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't remember that, but <laughs> no, I do. Um, so I, I was, I found it curious to measure social support as number of people because it seems like more of a quality thing than a quantity thing, right? Is like having four people really better than having three people. Sure. But I know sometimes when you're walking into data and want to explore something, use what you have. But I'm curious how you're going to look at it in your grant. Well, interesting you say that. At this point, um, it hasn't really been on the radar in terms of like my grant. I mean, I think it certainly should be. Um, so yeah, I mean, so. Yeah, going back to that data, should be right there. Yeah, so what, what this is is that this was part of a this really large collection that we did, and what it did is it said, you know, do you receive emotional support from your uh, child, if you have a child, yes or no, from your parents, yes or no, from your spouse, yes or no, from your friend, yes or no, and we made, it's, a, it's a crude measure, that's why it's a number of emotional support sources, right, now they talk about like, the quality like of it. So, yeah, it's certainly just using like what the data that, that, that we have up there, but um, I definitely am interested in, in pursuing this, especially because of the race ethnic differences that we are seeing in it. I think it's a very fruitful line of research that, frankly, I don't know anyone's really looking at, particularly like in, in the pain field. So, good to have that on our radar, though. Yeah, for sure. Yes? Yeah, very nice presentation. Um, so, yeah, lo looking at this figure here, 
I'm wondering, do you know anything about kind of cultural ethnic differences in how people sort of culture respond to pain? Yeah, well, it certainly differs. It's something that we, it's part of our, uh, you know, I think when we first like learn about pain, there are cultural differences like in this. And I know the most about the African American populations from my studies like back then too. And from there, um, I do know that it's perceived a little less medically and a little bit less spiritually, or it can be. So within African American uh, groups, for example, you might see uh, re reports which are relatively consistent of using things like praying for pain as opposed to seeking like treatment for it. So more like a reliance on, on something like that. And well, I think that could be a good thing. That's also praying when it comes to pain is considered a, a passive coping technique. And for the most part, passive coping techniques are generally associated with, with increased pain. But yeah, what I was wondering about more is cultural attitudes about pain. Like, you know, somebody has chronic pain, um, one kind of response may be, you know, oh, that's terrible, people feel bad about it, you know, want to be supportive of another, you know, okay, um, I don't want to hear about it anymore. All we talk about is your pain all the time, you know, what, what can I do? You know, and obviously that could have a big impact on the relationship with social support. It's a very different thing than coping strategies. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know of any literature that directly addresses how pain is discussed within the family. Um, it is an interesting avenue to to pursue. Because you know that is a very real thing when people have chronic pain. It's always there. You know, there's always some level of you know they're having to deal with it, and it impairs their ability to function and. Um, you know, if something's acute, people may respond, but after a while, um, how to how people sure. continue to respond or response falls off, you know, maybe really sure. Is, yeah. is, is Uncle Joe just really, really annoying, or is it like really like, oh, Uncle Joe is like suffering? How do we how do we help him? So you know, I just thinking that you know the relationship between the two might kind of be sure. Better. Yeah, and I mean, I I and I wonder if some that really plays in this too because. Um, again, as, as there's a speculation line though too, but if, if sort of there is more of an isolation kind of effect going on with a, the non latino white group, that kind of reflects more of this individ, individualistic maybe culture that is more prominent here than maybe some of the Latino like families where there might be more of a family support going on um, where people actually reached out to. So, um, but yeah, I don't, like I said, this is. Uh, a newer line in terms of the pain social support relationship that's, like I said, I think is interesting enough to definitely keep on pursuing. Okay, two meditation related questions, Matt. Oh, yay! And otherwise, excellent presentation as always. First one. Uh, you had spoken about some of the adverse effects from opioids and so forth earlier. What do you know about any of the latest research, say, applying uh, meditation, whether it's mindfulness meditation or perhaps another, towards helping opioids re uh, opioid addicts, say, recover, especially, say, some of our pain-addicted uh, opioid uh, uh, veterans? Well, like I said, I've, you know, thus far, I... Uh, haven't spent too much time working with opioid dependent individuals. I do know that there's a, a mindfulness based treatment, uh, Derek Garland is his name, he's out in Utah, and he has a treatment it's called MORE, Mindfulness Oriented Recovery Enhancement, I think, and he has like a mindfulness based treatment. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's as meditation focused as maybe some of the stuff that I would count as a meditation drive that treatment though, but that, uh, is specifically for opioid uh, dependent adults. And one of his strategies, which I think is really interesting, is that there's been a loss of natural reward that has basically been like hijacked from you know, overuse of, of opioids. And so as informal mindfulness exercises, for example, he would put like a, a bouquet of flowers up on the screen 
and use that as a mindfulness exercise to try to get them to internalize some beauty of thing that they're looking for, like basically trying to retrain the reward system to be uh, more elicited by natural cues as opposed to exogenous opioid cues. When I've spoken with our local SAR tip program, I know that they tell me something like, and there were 28, 30 days, they have something on the order of 200 classes they participate in. It's an insane number, but I'm not aware that any of those are, say, mindfulness classes or meditation classes. Well, I mean, I think they're really useful because the way that, again, I'm, I'm biased because I'm, I believe so much like meditation, but I mean, there's certainly, you know, the more awareness that we could have of our own <laughs> behavior in real time, you know, I think there's a really useful argument there of like, you know, if you ever, if ever, ever been like a, around a drug addict, you certainly see this noticeable change in affect from like, I'm not in drug seeking behavior mode, I'm in drug seeking behavior mode. Like, something I've seen this happen from my eyes, and, it, and it's just crazy. And some of my friends that I do know about that do several substances, I've, I've even tried to bring this out to them. I'm like, do, do you see what's going on right now? Like, we weren't talking about getting a drink, and then all of a sudden we are. I'm like, you've completely changed your affect. So, I really think that, that those, those awareness moments could be crucial for helping people sustain, especially in the context of the values, as, as I think are so important. Like, I don't, most people don't want to be drug addicts. Thank you. All right, second question on meditation. This one is related to the technology side. So you had mentioned that you were considering technological applications and things like, say, measuring adherence or perhaps measuring its effects on increased physical activity, that kind of stuff. What do you know about, say, some of the technological applications of meditation itself? Are people wearing headsets, using their phones, et cetera, that kind of stuff, to make it more portable and easy to use? Well, it's, there's certainly a lack of data out there um, comparing something like a, uh, a guided, you know, something that you download from an app, like Headspace, it seems like very popular right now, like, you know, using this, because you probably can track that, you know, how much people are using this. Uh, versus being able to, you know, use a guided meditation to get to the point where you're literally just sitting there with your own thoughts. And I know from some people that might be kind of like advanced. So, you know, again, like I'm, I'm biased, and I think it'd be interesting to like see what Paul is like, you know, thoughts are this because Paul and I do differ quite a bit on on meditation related thoughts about this. You know, I think that's probably better than doing nothing at all. But I don't think it's ever going to be as good as like teaching people how to how to literally like sit and meditate without being directed or, or by audio, you know, audio enhancement, like basically. So, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. That's very good because, uh, as you know, I recently just finished up a transcendental meditation study on PTSD, and we had, had some early discussions about some of the same kinds of things about taking transcendental meditation and trying to adopted into the 21st century, so to speak. And what I mostly encountered was resistance, that they felt as if the, the in-person contact, as you're saying, and the, the, the sort of traditions and ceremonial aspects around it were really vital and things that you couldn't effectively recreate through technology. But uh, myself not being personally attached to them, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not as sure about that. You're arguably a better candidate to study this because it's like, I mean, yeah. No, well, like I said, it, it is an empirical question and the one to, one to look at, too. I mean, but then, like all empirical questions, though, why I want to get more into real-time assessments is, I don't know how much we even, you know, how good, or how reliable the reports are going to get, too, you know, when we, it's something, a construct like mindfulness, we, how, we can't even really measure that, you know, we have these paper and pencil measures, but, People are going to argue to the death of them that this is this has nothing to do with mindfulness. These these measures. So um, yeah. One concrete application, then I'll end this off to someone else, is that we're following up on some of our pain stuff now to think about doing some sort of virtual reality project where people would be wearing a headset while they're getting things like steroid injections, and they need to be, of course, very still while they're in the procedure, so we can't have them moving around and interacting. So we need something that's that's very passive and immersive. And so something like a meditation exercise that is given to them, delivered to them through, say, a virtual reality headset. Well, see, yeah, I think, I think it's a really good application of that. I mean, I think for me personally, that's like talk about definitions of what is meditation, what is not meditation, maybe. But I mean, something like that, I think there's huge you know, utility for to use basically like a form of distraction to get someone's attention engaged in something else why some sort of adverse things going on, like a steroid injection. I think it's like wonderful, you know, applications for something like that. 
Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Matt, and thanks everyone.